Well, thanks. It's really nice to be here. Uh, I've, I've been to Sweden before, but this is my first trip to Stockholm, and everyone kept telling me how beautiful it is. And uh, you know, aside from a little bit of cool rain this morning, I think it certainly lived up to all my expectations. And looks like uh, the rain is letting up. Um, so I'm the chief game designer at Google. Um, that's a, a, a really fun title. It's it's a little bit. Um, uh, ambiguous, I guess, because I actually uh, only spent a part of my time working on game design and a large part of it also working as a developer advocate, which is doing exactly what I'm doing now, uh, not only talking about Google and our uh, products and services to developers, but also listening to developers and bring that information back to uh, our engineers. So if there are concerns you have, uh, it is my delight, delighted duty to uh, you know, pass them back on to hopefully people who can uh, handle them. Um, I've been, uh, as uh, Robert mentioned, I've been doing this a very long time. Uh, I've had uh, the great luck to, to get involved in games uh, right out of my university years uh, at a point when I had no idea it was even possible to make a living doing this sort of thing. And in fact, I was in the games industry for um, two and a half years before I met uh, the first person who actually was a full-time game designer. And I remember thinking, wow, that's amazing. I wonder if you know, I could switch to that at some point because in fact, most of us were just uh, programmers at first and coding everything from you know, not just the gameplay, but uh, also working out the graphics. I, I wouldn't say we were artists because a lot of that stuff was was uh, what some people call brick art. You know, just have these gigantic pixels. And but another story. I won't go into too much of the detail. But uh, I've worked in uh, a lot of areas. Uh, I was one of the early employees at, at Lucasfilm Games, became Lucas Arts, and the 3DO company and DreamWorks Interactive. And each of those, I was within the first ten employees and. Then I spent 16 years as a freelancer working on a whole range of everything from entertainment titles to serious games. I um, you know, just have always loved variety. And so ended up coming to Google uh, just almost exactly two years ago. And I'm happy to say that even working for a single company, I've never had as much variety in my, my career as well. And I'll get into a little bit of that uh, now. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about surfing lessons. Uh, I won't go into too much detail about that, but I just as a curiosity and just to sort of see how responsive people are. Um, this was uh, uh, a picture, I think, from uh, Hawaii, but uh, does anybody uh, know why I have a, a connection to the Caribbean from my, my career? Any ideas, speculations, an island somewhere in the Caribbean? No? Monkey Island, there you go, and you, you win a uh, Escape from Monkey Island coaster. Thank you very much. Okay, won't get into that. That's a complete red herring. I'm not going to talk about Monkey Island anymore, but I will talk about surfing a little later and we'll see. Um, the games industry has lots of trends, lots of ups and downs. Uh, when I first started working on the slide, I started labeling things, and there there were early peaks in things like the the release of the first Nintendo or the boom in arcade machines. There were early uh, troughs, like the the crash in 1984 of the arcade industry, where we lost about 90% of our business in the course of uh, just over a year. It was pretty horrendous. Um, but the nice thing about this, well, two nice things, I guess, about it. Uh, one of them is that the overall trend has gradually been up over time. And the other thing is, is that uh, when one of us or one group of, of people is experiencing a downturn, uh, generally there have been other people that are experiencing a very positive upturn. And I'm sure you've seen that. You know, it's it's one of those things that's very common throughout the whole games industry that you'll get a, a big company that will lay off a lot of people, and it seems like a terrible disaster until you see all of the new startups that form from the people that used to work there. And a lot of the big uh, hubs of game development in the world today. Uh, particularly when they're in uh, surprising places like Austin, Texas, are because of one or two big companies that sort of exploded and, and uh, spawned a bunch of other companies. And uh, overall, as I say, it 
is an upward trend. And I don't think we've ever had as much opportunity and certainly never had as much variety in different types of games, different types of platforms, um, and more attention and certainly more players. The, the fact that there are you know, around a billion people playing games in the world now with every expectation that we will have multiple billions of people uh, playing before very long. In fact, uh, we've had games, of course, I, I think we're, we're up to, well, I, I don't want to quote the exact numbers on, on how many people are playing any particular game, I guess, but uh, we, we certainly have had games that have had over 100 million uh, monthly active users. And I think reaching a billion uh, users on a single game is within our, our reach at this point. It's very exciting. And that scale also uh, has shown that even though we have these sort of waves of innovation that happen, sometimes you get really big waves. And I, I'm going to talk uh, briefly about three of those that I think are relevant. One was the early wave of game consoles, and uh, th that has sort of come in succession. But each time there has been a new generation of consoles coming out, there's been a, a big uptick in players and a lot of excitement. Uh, and that really came about because a lot of technologies were ready at the right time. People had televisions in their home, and here were these you know, uh, microprocessors that were finally capable of creating actually pretty good imagery and hooking up to the TV so you didn't have to buy an expensive monitor like they, they did in, in labs before that. Um, and then uh, about 10 years after uh, some of those first uh, console games were in the homes, the World Wide Web came into to view. And again, it was a combination of the fact that the internet had been around for uh, about, I think, 15, 20 years at that point, but had not been visually oriented. It was mostly for sending files and, and text back and forth. And they realized that the graphic cards on computers were good enough so that they can actually show great imagery. And that happened largely because games were pushing the quality of those graphics cards. And similarly, there were mostly gamers who had modems in their homes so that they could play one-on-one -on -one or multiplayer games, very primitive compared to what came later, but it meant that there was that capability actually on a consumer level. And those different technologies suddenly came together, and within a very short amount of time, even if you didn't play games, you had to get a modem so you could hook up and join uh, America Online or, or uh, you know whatever was popular here in Sweden, I'm not sure. Uh, but it moved on very quickly. And then finally, uh, just starting around 2007, 2008, smartphones started to come around. And we would had phones for quite a while, and that built up phone infrastructure. Uh, but cheap, or at least relatively inexpensive and portable touchscreens became uh, possible. The first touchscreens that I saw were, were table-sized and had very low resolution. And finally, it got to that point where it was portable. And with each of these things, we also needed the processing power to get faster and often graphics cards or uh, you know the, the chipsets to become faster, more powerful. And with mobile in particular, it also had to become lighter. And those spawned uh, revolutions, you know, as we've seen, of course, particularly with the World Wide Web and with smartphones, it had a big impact on games. But of course, it had a huge impact beyond that in the rest of the world. And one of the reasons that I'm here is that I think we're ready for the next one of those revolutions. It's been a while since the last one. And this one uh, I've been calling transmogrified reality. And it's, it's an odd word. Um, it's uh, certainly unusual in English. I, I don't know about uh, Swedish equivalents. Uh, in fact, when I bring this up, uh, people refer to an old cartoon about a uh, transmogrifier uh, box and uh, uh, the cartoon that was popular in the US um, and don't even know what the word means. But the basic definition is to transform, especially in a surprising or magical manner. And I think, uh, yes? So are, you, are you certain that this is not a kind of a hit and end uh, revolution? That uh, the, the, the pictures that you've shown were probably not the screen. Oh, yes. No, it was a word that had been around for quite some time. Yeah, yeah. It just was a very unusual word. In fact, uh, Google has a service where when you look up a word, you can actually click on a little box, and it will show its usage over history. And I, I haven't checked that specifically with Transmogrify, but I, I certainly knew of the word before uh, it was in the cartoon. Um, and we've seen, I think what, what's necessary is that we're at a point where uh, basically virtual world and the real world can be mixed together. 
Uh, and I think we're moving to the point where that will become seamless. And it may take a while, but in movies, for example, we've had films around for over 100 years now, and they had special effects in them almost from the beginning. But at first, it was not ever really meant to, to fool the eye. It was more of a sort of metaphor. You had um, you know, the uh, voyage to the moon, and, and you had these very almost silly uh, kind of costumes and effects and things. Um, but gradually, it got better and better. Uh, 30 years ago, we started to have computer graphics involved in, in it, and uh, I was working with Lucasfilm, uh, and we would hang out with the people at ILM that were doing the, the top-level uh, visual effects, and they would explain to us about, uh, we're doing that one with a blue screen, and this is a matte painting, and this other one we're doing with a practical effect, but we're augmenting it by, by doing wire removal so you don't see that somebody's actually being pulled along on a wire. Um, all these different techniques that they had. And then gradually, computer graphics started to become more and more popular. And after, for a while, being very sensitive to how each of these effects were done, and I'd see something in a movie, and I'd say, oh, yeah, I, I know what they're doing there. Gradually, I would realize it had to be computer graphics because it, it looked so real and it was impossible any other way. But I couldn't see it anymore, and it became seamless that way. And I believe we're, we're moving in that direction haven't quite reached it yet, but are getting very close with computer games and images that we have here. And a lot of that is coming from virtual reality, augmented reality. Um, there are a lot of different ways people are doing that. Uh, in a lot of these things, you need to have special tags on the walls of the room to orient uh, your cameras, or possibly it's, it's markers on a headset so that, that cameras can look at it. There's a, a company called Cast AR that uses this special retro-reflective material, this sort of shiny material that bounces light beams directly back, and they have some special goggles. A uh, very interesting, very creative uh, technique. Um, the fact is, though, there are many different pathways to just make it seem like it works to mix in these virtual images with our real world and have them blend together. There was only one company or one you know, patent that pe everyone was working on. I'd be a little bit concerned that perhaps this is still quite a ways from gelling, but there really are multiple things that are coming together, very much like those multiple paths that I was talking about with other technologies. And in this case, I, I'm only listing a few of them here, but you have uh, augmented reality where people have the real world shining through, but they also can mix in some computer images that one way or another are uh, hooked into the real world. Sometimes they just float in the air as you move your head. Other times they appear to actually be situated in the world. That's been a, a challenging thing. Uh, virtual reality, of course, has been getting a lot of press time, and, and uh, Shani will be talking about uh, how cardboard is becoming popular. We, we actually just had, are you going to mention the, the announcements uh, today? Pardon? Let's go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, we, we just announced today, in fact, I, I was told before I came on this trip that the plan was to announce it a few days earlier, so I'm really glad that it happened You know, in time for this talk tonight. Uh, we have a, a program called uh, Works with Cardboard, where we're going to essentially verify uh, that a an application or, uh, or a game, many of them will be games, uh, is certified to work with a cardboard compliant, not one of ours necessarily, but anybody who makes cardboard to our specs. And we're going to issue special NFC tags so that if you have a slightly different um, type of cardboard with a, a different interocular distance or you know other qualities that, that would otherwise make it difficult to focus, this will let the uh, phone that is plugged into that cardboard know what those qualities are and adjust its imagery to uh, give you the best experience for that. And uh, we simultaneously announced the acquisition of some companies, including some people that I've worked with personally uh, that have come from um, a company called uh, Skillman and Hackett, where they were doing something called Tilt Brush that is an amazing uh, virtual reality paint program, essentially. And I'm, uh, I didn't know that they had actually joined us until I saw the announcement today. I'm very glad they're on, on board. Um, but I'm looking forward to working with them. Fact is, we've been thinking about what this would be like for a long time. That I read science fiction stories when I was a child about things that we would easily recognize as virtual reality. Then, of course, we had you know movies and, and TV shows, uh, very notably Star Trek: The Next Generation and the Holodeck, uh, but also you know The Matrix, taking it you know even a step farther. Uh, but even as far back as 1983, I I had a, a talking about VR. I was thinking about this image I had seen years ago, and I I couldn't find the book I found it in, but I remembered the the person who had made it and contacted him. 
and got this picture of what he thought the uh, arcade of the future would look like. And uh, we had some people playing with the VR system here just uh, a couple hours ago, and it looks actually remarkably like this when somebody has you know the headsets and uh, the, the, the 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 virtual reality uh, goggles and and uh, audio headsets there. Another thing that's worth looking at, if you watch uh, the movie Back to the Future 2, there's uh, a scene where they're sitting at dinner and several of the people there have these VR headsets on. There's a, a little scene where a phone call comes in and you could see them all lighting up simultaneously and, and saying, Mom, phone, which is actually kind of funny because I think then she had to pick up a wall phone or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, Back to the Future 2 was set in that far future year of 2015. So interesting that uh, a lot of people are predicting we would get to this place. In order to do that, though, um, the technologies, as with these other kinds of uh, you know, big waves that happen, have to come together. And one of them that I'm particularly excited about is our own Project Tango. Uh, Project Tango is a, a, a concept of giving devices uh, human-like understanding of their surroundings, that uh, if your, your phone or your tablet kind of knows where it is in the world and knows what the room and the area around it looks like, it enables just a huge number of interesting applications. And games are certainly one of the first things that are going to benefit, but it won't stop there. And uh, it's just one component of what I'm, I'm talking about with this sort of transmogrified reality uh, revolution, but it's going to be an essential one. And to give you an idea of it, I've got a little video that we, we can run. Um, let's see if this will work. And I'm going to talk over this to, to narrate a little bit of what you're seeing. Um, but this is starting with somebody using a Tango device in a uh, five-story building, I believe, to go through that room. And as he walks through, it's tracking the features there, tagging them, and creating this, this map uh, demonstrating six degrees of uh, freedom motion tracking. Uh, we also had one hooked up to somebody's bicycle helmet to see what it would be like to try and in real time capture uh, a city. And as you can see, it's able to pick up and situate that very well to see how it would behave if uh, things were a little challenging. Take a look over here on the side as it sees without any kind of uh, uh, janking at all that it's following all the, the motion of that uh, roller coaster. And then this is showing, uh, registering a point cloud of these yellow points in that virtual white star floating there to this bookshelf and it's tracking all those little yellow dots and you can see it's doing a remarkably good job of keeping those uh, even as it turns away and comes back it looks like those are actually floating in the same spaces all the time and even when you have a complex area that you're walking through with lots of people who are constantly moving and hard to, to uh, track down it's tracking all of those points and screening out the ones that are changing and realizing that those are unreliable for uh, building the, the data. And it can also scan in rooms using a number of different sensors that it has. Uh, you can see that it's, it's picking up stuff. It uses an infrared depth sensor to see how far away things are. It uses a black and white wide degree lens uh, to, to capture as well and processes all of that together with uh, also a visual uh, image that it gets from a, a regular camera and allows it in real time to actually map out uh, rooms or even whole houses. And as it goes through and goes through the same area over and over again, it gets better and better at working that out. So here you can see real time meshing that's running in Unity, uh, even as they're running a physics engine. And those balls are bouncing around and they go through the walls until it gets close enough to see a wall is there and suddenly the wall pops in and they bounce off of it. Um, obvious game possibilities there, uh, but also some pretty amazing uh, applications that are not games that you get from being able to map out rooms in real time. And one of those, for example, is indoor mapping so that instead of just having a uh, you know, GPS level position, you can actually see where you are in a room and this is a demo of uh, somebody who wants to get to one of our conference rooms being directed there by these moving blue arrows that appear to float along the floor. And this is actually in the uh, uh, Tango uh, building, uh, which is got, uh, there we go, gets you to the room that you need to go to. So wonderful stuff uh, to break down some of what you just saw. There's motion tracking, uh, Tango tablet, 
uh, instead of just the sort of three degrees of knowing which way it's pointing that a lot of phones have with the gyroscopes and accelerometers built in, it's actually got better gyroscopes and accelerometers, and it uses also the information from all those sensors I was mentioning of, you know, a 3D, uh, or rather an infrared depth sensor, 120 degree wide angle lens, and then the regular uh, camera lens. Uh, to track motion in six degrees of freedom. So it knows when it's moving up and down, even if you're pointing it in the same direction or left and right, that sort of thing. Uh, then you've got the depth perception I mentioned where it's bouncing an infrared signal off of what it sees from about half a meter out to roughly three meters, uh, varies depending on you know lighting and interference, uh, and gets a really good view of the depth of what it's seeing. So it can correlate and tell the difference between a microphone that may be close and the back of this that's far away, even though from a visual point of view, they appear to be uh, overlapping. And then finally, area learning, it puts all that together, forms a, a, a memory of an area, and uh, allows you to uh, set that up and map it. And some of the things that can be used for, imagine with, with real estate and people trying to rent or sell uh, apartments and houses, one of the things that will be amazing is to be able to go into an empty house scan it in just by walking around and having it, you know, uh, uh, kind of t talk you through all the areas that it's seen and have you point at the areas that it hasn't seen yet until it's mapped the whole place. Then you do the same thing in your existing home and then you have it picture your furniture in the new home and move it around and see whether this apartment will work for you or whether your bed doesn't quite fit through that door or won't look good with the window view that you have there. Uh, that will also be great for the people who sell home furnishings, you know, furniture, but also appliances. You know, the view we have here is, you know, think about what it will look like when this unfinished room is, uh, you know, fully decked out with appliances. And what if you wanted to upgrade to a, a bigger refrigerator or, you know, a different uh, stovetop and you can see what it would look like in the actual place that it was going to be, not just on the show floor. So that's the kind of thing that I think will be amazing for people who are doing uh, more than just games. Uh, but I think games will have a lot of wonderful possibilities, too. That This is actually uh, an image of a 3D version of a room that has been mapped in with some post-processing. Uh, the quality of the image can be improved if you have some processors work on it later. So I believe a lot of the early games are likely to have people have a simple type of gameplay that will help them map in the room and spend some time processing. And once the system has worked that out and has a higher resolution picture, you can now play full games and versions of the room that you're in. So what, what will those be like? Well, these are some very tame, uh, not very uh, uh, you know, out there ideas, but just to kind of get you along the, the, uh, the range there. Imagine if you use the Tango uh, partly as a controller, and uh, stealth games are rather popular, but in stealth games, generally, you use your, your mouse and the keyboard uh, or you know a, a game controller to move a character stealthily through a space. In this case, you can hold that tango, and it knows how fast it's going, how fast it's being turned, and precisely where in the room it's going. It would be perfect to have it for a laser maze that you have to actually find your way through in physical space. Uh, you know, and, and, and it doesn't have to be quite like this picture, but, you know, you're actually moving through something. And perhaps we have that repeated through our, our wonderful Android TV technology to your, your television set. So you can be watching the TV and seeing the lasers only through the, the television view and having to move that tango at a precise speed, you know, never exceeding half a meter per second or whatever speed you, you find works in the game. And so if somebody drops it or moves a little bit too quickly, the guards can come out. Um, Another idea I like very much is the idea of blending and you know finding the room that you're in and then adding things to it. You know, possibly it's some sort of adventure game or a hidden object game. Possibly it's a, a survival horror game that, that tend to be quite popular. But when you open the closet, there's a monster there. There's a tentacle reaching out from under the bed. And one of the things I find creepy in a, a really fun way is that then you shut the game off and you're still in the same room. So that's going to be a very interesting thing to adjust to. Or uh, I was talking to, to Tommy last night and, and we were speculating about murder mystery games. Same kind of thing here where you can have a murder mystery where the clues are set in your house and using this sort of mix of virtual and augmented reality, you might open the drawer and find the murder weapon as a virtual weapon there uh, or possibly be able to plant real information and record that 
with your tango and meanwhile other players are also doing that in other rooms so that then you all get together and try and find out who was the uh, the culprit in this this crime. Lots of really fun things you can do when you incorporate your own room. And of course, it doesn't have to look exactly like your room. Again, it's not a uh, you know uh, artist level depiction of it, but the idea is that you could take physical objects and gradually replace them with fantasy world equivalents so that the table in your room can actually be a rock or perhaps you like uh, a Lord of the Rings kind of look so you're in a um, tavern in Brie instead of in your, at your dining room table and it's made out of old oak instead of uh, metal and your friends look like uh, elves and dwarves and hobbits now. So you can actually uh, set that up or perhaps you have a dining room party and there are a couple empty chairs that you reserve so that the Tango device can fill those empty chairs with Albert Einstein and Marilyn Monroe or, you know, living celebrities of your choice if you, you prefer or possibly have your and you know, Aunt uh, Sophie uh, look like Marilyn Monroe because you think that's an improvement. Up to you. Um, Shani will talk more about cardboard. One of the things that becomes particularly interesting is some of these things I've talked about sound like virtual reality. And in fact, if you uh, do a head mounted display and it has that sort of tango capability, that's very interesting to think of what might be possible when we get to that point. Uh, as of December, we had uh, over half a million of, of these uh, cardboards shipped, and we had now have a, we can prove at least a half a million plus however many there were in that box. But it's been a while since December, so I, I, I think we can count on a, a bigger number than that. But things have been going quite well with with cardboard. But I promised I'd, I'd get back to the uh, surfing lessons here, and um, I'm running a little ahead of time, so we'll be able to 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 keep up here. Uh, the fact is, when you know, I depicted these things as big waves of innovation and how I think that uh, occasionally you get these particularly unusually significant ones, and this is one of them. And I, surfing is a, an interesting analogy, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized that there are a lot of similarities in what we end up doing as game developers to what surfers have to do, that you really have a timing issue. And there are many other things to surfing than, than this, but... Uh, and critically, one of the things that happens, you're waiting for a big wave and you don't want to start, uh, you know, paddling too soon or or you might, you know, miss the big wave and only ride a small one in and maybe the big one comes in and, and, and overturns you. Or if you're if you're too late, you see it recede into the distance and somebody's riding this wonderful wave onto the shore and you're still paddling and not getting anywhere. So getting it just right in the middle is very difficult. And, you know, just to, to take this image here, some of these people uh, went out uh, early, you know, maybe they rode a wave in that was not one of the big ones, or maybe they're just getting out there as the waves are getting big. It's pretty important to get in there and practice and try things, you know, that one of the things that happens in the games industry is that in the 35 years I've been doing this, I've done many different things, that there is nobody who can actually stay working on one particular type of thing all that time because we're constantly reinventing ourselves and the technology changes, the business models change, the audience changes uh, in, in many ways. So you have to keep adapting and you have to essentially keep practicing and keep trying. So I don't recommend just waiting until the absolute perfect moment and not doing anything. I'm just suggesting that you might try some small experiments until you feel that you have the skill set that you need and then all the time be looking for those really big waves to come along. And if you're a little bit too late, uh, you know, it's not, not terribly bad. Uh, you know, you, you might, uh, in, in the real world, big waves tend to come in clusters. Uh, it turns out there it's a myth that they come in exact clusters of seven. But after quite a while of waiting, you do get several big waves one after another. And that also seems to be true. You know, when uh, smartphones came around, it wasn't just that there was, you know, one game or one company that benefited from it. There were some that did very well just in the first year or two others that, that did even better when they figured out how to, to make better games that took advantage of it and that the market had expanded. Uh, now it's getting harder and harder to compete in that area unless you're a pretty big company, but it's time to be looking for a new set of waves, I think. Um, if you wait too long, though, you can just barely see the heads of a couple people there that you know basically are being so conservative and maybe going in so deep that they're missing the opportunities that a lot of other people are taking. If you see other people doing well, it's a sign that you really have uh, have to get moving and, and paddle 
uh, very quickly that what happens is as these waves get bigger, as they get closer to shore, they both get taller and they start to move faster. And that's also very much like what happens with waves of innovation in the games industry. Um, here's a couple people that maybe are going to make it. They're, they're positioned pretty well. Uh, it's not clear whether they've made it really uh, to the precise point. But of course, you know, one person in this group seems to have found everything just right. And even then, there's uh, questions of luck. There's uh, how skilled, you know, how how talented that that person may be. And it's an analogy here. Of course, this can be a whole company or just an individual. And really, what that brings me to, it's an old saying, but uh, the Chinese character for crisis is actually made up of the characters for danger and opportunity combined. And that's uh, very wise. A crisis really is when you have both danger and opportunity at once. And these big waves are very much like that to a surfer and to an app or a game developer as well. Uh, when you have so much riding on it and there's this potential to be the first one to make a wonderful new game in virtual reality, for example, or the first one to, to sell a million unit uh, VR game to an open market, uh, if you're one of the very early ones there, it's almost an open, you know, there's a, a saying about blue ocean strategies when it's a very wide open area and we're in that place right now with what I'm calling transmogrified reality. Virtual reality, there have been attempts. The first one I saw was back in 1984 when a man named Jaron Lanier coined the term virtual reality and was showing it off to just a few people early on. Uh, one of the people I worked with was a friend of his and he came in and was showing us this data glove that it's very clunky by today's standards, but was quite miraculous then that let him manipulate the screen with, with gestures, which of course is a familiar idea now, but it was revolutionary then. And yet, you know, it hasn't really caught on in all that time since then. And as I've hopefully made the case, I think we're right there and those big waves are coming. So really, I hope to see what kinds of uh, opportunities you take, what you make out of it. I'm looking forward you know, even uh, next year to coming back and seeing some great uh, VR games on Tango and Cardboard, um, on other systems as well. You know, I'm not particular that way. I just love to see the innovation, and I'm confident that Google will be there to support whatever comes out. Uh, we're working in a lot of really exciting directions, and I uh, hope to, to help you with that as we move forward into the future. So I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you very much.